the Amazon rainforest is one of the largest, if not the largest in the world. Rainforests are critically important for the global climate in many ways. It regulates temperature and weather cycles in the Americas, and it actually carries rain to much of the continent, which is a breadbasket for the world. And they have what are called flying rivers above the jungle, these bands of moisture that really affect and regulate weather patterns far from the Amazon. And even more critical now with climate change, the destruction of the Amazon, which has been accumulating over decades, is accelerating almost at the point of no return. Scientists are warning that we're getting closer and closer to a tipping point, that we may even be there already. So if we pass that tipping point, we start seeing the rainforest turning into a savanna, where you don't have the trees that are able to pull all that pollution out of the air. You don't have the ecosystem that's producing the rainfall that feeds the continent. Brazil's government says it's working to stop deforestation. But behind the scenes, it's actively engaged in a campaign to privatize and develop the Amazon. And it's really being fueled and encouraged by a government that really believes that the Amazon is there to be developed, to be privatized, to be exploited for its natural riches. Unless we find a way to reduce the sort of voracious demand in the world for the commodities that come out of the Amazon, it's really hard to see how this cycle of destruction will really ever end. And eventually it's gonna to be too late. If you want to know why the Amazon is being destroyed, it's not because people just want to destroy it. It's because they're doing it for the things that we're consuming far, far away. You have to understand it from the perspective of certain forces in Brazil, especially the forces behind ranching and logging. You really just need to go to your local Home Depot and look at the hardwoods that are being sold there, many of which come from Brazil and many of which come from the Amazon, and those are going on your living room floor. Or think about it the next time you have a barbecue and you're enjoying a, a really nice steak or you buy a burger. Well, the beef that you're eating is part of this global beef system that starts in the Amazon. As much as the messaging is that they don't want people in the Amazon to be burning the Amazon, what the world is really telling these people is that we will pay you to burn the Amazon because we will buy everything that you're selling us. The Amazon rainforest, it's lost in the past 40 years an area the size of California. There was progress that was being made in slowing those burns. That's changed. The burns are accelerating this year. They were at an 11-year high last year. So why isn't anyone being held accountable? This was a story that was a year in the making, and the more I started digging, it became obvious that everyone in the Amazon region is seeking a piece of land and grabbing a piece of public land. And the government is not only looking the other way, but in many ways, they're actually encouraging it. After spending some time on the ground and talking to dozens dozens and dozens of ranchers, of enforcers, of park rangers, of people within Bolsonaro's inner circle. It becomes clear that everything pushes these ranchers and these farmers towards the decisions that they make. Not only do we have the insatiable demand for commodities, but it's rooted in Brazil's culture and it's rooted in Brazil's history. In the 70s and 80s, the Brazilian policy was very much to encourage industrialized farmers and manufacturers into the Amazon because they wanted to develop the Amazon as Brazil's ticket to first world status. This was during the Brazilian miracle, years of extremely high economic growth when the government was calling people to the Amazon. A lot of poor Brazilians had been working this land for decades and yet they had no claim to this land. And so the policy shifted from encouraging the big farmers and favoring the big guy into let's help the little guy. 
And it was one of the biggest social welfare giveaways of all time, where they started handing out government land in the Amazon to small farmers, to poor Brazilians. You had TV ads, you had radio ads, you had ads in magazines that drove people to the Amazon and encouraged millions of people to move from the coastal cities into the Amazon and conquer what they were calling the green hell. And they said it was a land, land without, without men, men for, for men, men without, without land. land. That's what drove this massive migration of people to the Amazon, to stake their claim in the Amazon, to sort of be homesteaders to clear a piece of land and make something of it and contribute to this rapaciously growing economy in Brazil. That message, several decades later, still persists. It's very much in the Brazilian culture that in order to prosper, you need to have land. There's almost a roadmap to how deforestation happens. It's a very predictable cycle. In the Amazon, you have a mess of a land management system. And so there's a lot of public land that hasn't been designated for a specific purpose. Typically, poor Brazilians will go in. They're the foot soldiers of deforestation in a lot of ways. They'll claim this land. They'll band together and really create these societies. The hardwoods are always the first to go. And so the easiest way to sort of survive is to get cattle and sell it to the internal market or the global market. They don't last too long on the land because it's, uh, it's very difficult to make a living in the end. And so a lot of these families are pushed off their land eventually or bought out of their land. And it's at that point that the big ranchers and the big farmers come in and they start gathering this land and accumulating land empires. And they're able to say, we didn't clear the land. We weren't the ones who burned it down. They build their empires and they start producing soybeans, coffee, cacao in Brazil. These are not small farmer products. They require irrigation and investment, and they require a lot of money. It's typically the big farmers who get into this. The Bolsonaro administration didn't invent the practice of turning a blind eye as the Amazon is raided and granting amnesty afterwards. However, the government, through its actions, is accelerating those land grabs like never before. They have stripped the regulating agencies of their manpower. The budgets have been cut. The people in charge of land management agencies are ranchers and farmers who have a direct stake in making sure that this system keeps running. And possibly most damaging is that the government wants to amnesty more recent invasions and bigger invasions than ever before. Scientists tell us that this is the decisive decade. President Biden this in the United the States began to try to sort of pressure Brazil into doing something to rein in the destruction of the Amazon. President Biden invited President Bolsonaro to a, a climate summit that was held in 2021. President Bolsonaro. He was defiant. What he pointed to was this idea of an, an Amazonian paradox. What he meant by that was that Brazil's rainforest is one of the greatest resources in the world. And yet 24 million people who live around the Amazon region, they're poor. So he basically said, if the United States or any other uh, richer nation in the world wants Brazil to stop deforestation, they got to pay for it. Just getting to the Amazon is a hike. I live in Sao Paulo. Just flying there is a really long journey. There's no cell service. The roads are terrible. And so anywhere you go is, is a journey. We visit one town where this had happened approximately 20 years ago called Union Bandeirantes. And this is a town that really didn't exist except in the last 20 years. It was pure rainforest. 
And now almost 2,000 families ended up settling there. Everywhere you look, you see coffee plantations and cattle ranches, and you have thousands and thousands of farmers who have been living on this land that they don't have title to. One of the most surprising aspects of the journey that we took was that it's really hard to find clear villains there. I think from the outside, you look at the Amazon and you think, well, you know, monsters that are tearing down this beautiful rainforest. When you get there and you start talking to these people, you realize that some of the decisions they've made are decisions that other people would have made if they were in those shoes. One of the farmers that we spent some time with is a man named Bayamu. A few decades ago, he traded a motorcycle for a plot of land. And 20 years later, he has built a mini empire. He was a small farmer with 200 hectares or so. And he'd made the transition from cattle to coffee. It was something he was very proud of. One of the arguments that you hear from environmentalists and from people looking abroad is that there should be sustainable ways to live in harmony with the forest. Então ele ele o cara hoje que vive da floresta, ele vive na abaixo da linha da pobreza. Porque como é que ele vai a forma dele sobreviver é tirando o que a floresta produz. Então todo mundo que vive disso aí vive mais na miséria mesmo. Que na renda é muito pouca. E o governo, o governo não ajuda, não dá ajuda de nada. There's no market for the products that you make when you are producing from the forest. Muito difícil, muito difícil, porque ele não consegue tirar renda da floresta para sobreviver. Another man who we met was named Everaldo Pandolfi. He was one of the original settlers of Unión Bandarenches. He arrived in around 2000 with a few of his brothers, and it was pure rainforest when they arrived. Pandolfi recognizes that to make a living on the land, you have to clear the land. That's just the way it is. There's no other way to, to do it in his view. He went for the hardwoods first because that brings in the fast cash. He torched the scrub to clean it up, and then he put cattle on the land. I já fui até, já fui atuado três vezes. Rapaz, eu acho que sem desmatar é meio impossível a pessoa que é criada na roça, né? Porque que nem eu sou, sou de uma família de agricultor desde pequenininho. Eu não nasci trabalhando na roça e e até hoje vivi na roça. Eu só sei produzir, plantar e colher. Não sei fazer outra coisa. E para plantar e colher tem que desmatar, porque senão você não consegue produzir, ui. That's what was repeated over and over and again in this particular town, and it's been repeated across the Amazon, and it's really a driving force behind the deforestation that we're that we're seeing now. On the other end of this story, you have the industrialized ranchers and farmers. Some of these guys have amassed land empires in the tens of thousands of hectares, which is possible only if you were awarded it by the dictatorship, you bought it up from small farmers or their land grabs themselves. One of the ranchers we met, a very successful rancher, Adelio Barfoldi, his history is like the history of so many people that have settled in the Amazon. He migrated to the Amazon from another part of Brazil uh, in search of a prosperity that he couldn't find at home. Barafaldi is a staunch supporter of Bolsonaro, as are most of the big ranchers and farmers in the state and throughout the Amazon. These are the guys that Bolsonaro says can solve the problem of deforestation. And so as Bolsonaro is seeking to uh, amnesty a lot of these land grabs, the biggest change that he's proposing is allowing these big farmers who have deforestated more recently to apply for official title to this Amazon land. Over the years, Adelio Barfali has amassed over 40,000 hectares of land, and he strived to actually follow the law in Brazil. 
he built his cattle ranching empire on a system that is designed to be gamed in a way. And he has actually tried, in his view, is to really follow the rules in Brazil that do allow you to go in and, and develop a cattle ranch. Eu não vou colocar em risco um patrimônio fazendo essa parte ilegal de derrubar mata ou fazer, não dá. Nós temos a responsabilidade perante os órgãos ambientais de cuidar dessa área. Então a gente tem que se fazer, é colocar, às vezes, segurança, o nosso pessoal do, da, da fazenda, fazendo circular a fazenda como um todo sempre, para evitar invasores. He actually replanted a lot of the preserve that he's required to have under federal law. These are the guys that'll say that are the biggest advocates for privatizing the Amazon because they say they have the resources to protect the Amazon. And what you're seeing now is the land invasion sort of flipping on its head in that you have large property owners who are, are still fighting for that land because they don't actually own title to a lot of this stuff. So they're still fighting for this land by smaller farmers who are trying to break into their reserves and cut down their trees. Over the years, the public undesignated land has pretty much been snapped up. What's left in the Amazon are protected parks and indigenous territories. And so those are the lands that are now under attack. There are people that are trying to fight this sort of wave of destruction as best they can. And one of them is a, uh, is a park ranger. We met a man named Carlos Hangel. He's a 72-year-old park ranger. He's ready to retire. He's been fighting this fight for 20 years, and he will plain say he's exhausted. He dreams of retiring to write the great Brazilian novel, but he's afraid to leave his job because he's afraid that his replacement won't have the same sort of drive to protect the land. He oversees a park that is twice the size of uh, Rhode Island, and he does it with a staff of just a few people. It's basically been a long campaign to fight back, to keep back people who want to go into his park and turn it into cattle ranches. He goes out into the woods with his rangers and he's hacking his way through the woods with the machetes. This is a car that they opened and it has some miles to go to the inside that took a lot of wood. But it wasn't just here. This car has an entrance here and other ramais Eles roubaram muita madeira ao longo desse de 2016 para cá. Então agora a fiscalização tem estado muito frequente em cima e temos evitado. No começo, quando eles não sabiam. It's incredibly difficult work because the forest, you go 10 feet and you can't see the person anymore. It's easy for them to escape. Sometimes it'll take 12 hours to get 20 kilometers. We weren't able to make those journeys because it was just so deep into the forest that they were happening. Brazil does need to resolve its land titling system. It's a system that is so dysfunctional that in many cases you don't know who the real owner is. A lot of people are making a lot of money from the dysfunctional land management system that's in place. There's an incentive to keep that going, to not fix this broken system, because otherwise Brazil would run out of space to feed the world's appetite for commodities. It's a really complicated and nuanced phenomenon. It's just not going to be solved unless you really recognize the social, economic, political, and cultural forces that are behind that drive destruction of the Amazon. Mm -hmm.